Um, my name is Paul Brown, and I'm the director of the Center for Studies in Religion and Society. And this is the final talk in the City Talks lecture series. Um, the City Talks lecture series is put on by the, the Committee for Urban Studies at the University of Victoria. We also decided to kind of um, piggyback uh, this lecture series with the Center for Studies in Religion and Society weekly lecture series. So it's also the final lecture in that series. So a lot is riding on Valerie's shoulders to be <laughs> fantastically brilliant in both the CSRS way and in a City Talks kind of way. This particular uh, lecture tonight is actually sponsored as well by the John Albert Hall uh, series, which is a, a uh, series which is supported by the Anglican Diocese of uh, Victoria. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce uh, tonight's speaker. Um, Valerie Amaro is a professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Montreal, and she holds Canada Research Chair in Religious Pluralism. She's held positions at the Salta Mark Block in Berlin, the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies in Italy, and at the CNRSCURAPP, they love this kind of thing in France, <laughs> <laughs> uh, at the Université de Jules Verne Picardie in Amiens, I think. Um, her current research focuses on the legal regulation of conflicts caused by religious pluralism, as well as ethnographic explorations of the relationship between pluralism and radicalization within urban contexts. Valerie's articles have uh, appeared in a number of journals, notably Critique Internationale, uh, Canadian Criminal Law Review, American Behavioral Scientist, and most recently, really quite clearly the peak of her career, she contributed a chapter to a book that I'm co-editing on <laughs> religious radicalization and securitization in Canada and beyond. And I really have to say, and I'm not just saying this to suck up to the speaker, although I am kind of known for that, um, her, she's seen the video, just so she knows I do this kind of thing. Um, the, her her, her uh, chapter in our book is really, in my view, I think the most brilliant and subtle analysis of the phenomena that we were all trying to uh, trace in the book. Um, in her chapter, she traces why it is most people, when they're thinking about religion and radicalization, go so horribly wrong in their analysis. And she adds a whole different dimension to the approach to religious radicalization. In 2013, she received a Teaching Excellence Award at uh, UDM. And I've known Valerie for several years in the context of both Metropolis Project, um, which has been an international and national research project on ethnic diversity in, in, in cities mostly, and uh, was very fortunate to be able to deepen our, our relationship, uh, our friendship, in the context of the research project on radicalization. And therefore, when I had an opportunity to choose speakers for this uh, series on religion in the city, it was obvious to me that I needed to, to uh, bring Valerie into the conversation. So it's been a real pleasure to, to have a chance to get to know her a little bit better in this context. And I'm very pleased to be able to introduce her so that we all have a chance to learn from her uh, research and have her stimulate us in some critical discussions. So the format for this evening is going to be that uh, she'll present her lecture for about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll have a kind of a long-rated uh, conversation around the themes that, that she uh, introduces. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Valerie and Lily. Good evening. Um, that, that's a lot of pressure. Uh, I'm French. You may realize that a bit later when I'm stressed about this French accent, so I apologize for that. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. It's my second visit to Victoria, and every time it's like I wish I would be settling here. But then I go back to Montreal and I love Montreal too, so I'm like uh, hesitating. But I'm more and more I come, more and more I feel like I will one day come more than 24 hours. So um, I thank the organizer for the opportunity to present my views on one big question, which is the one you see on the first slide. I've done a PowerPoint, this is a big miracle because I'm not a PowerPoint person, but I thought it might help you to figure out visually what I'm trying to explain. Uh, orally. So, my main concern tonight is to discuss with you, to really engage a in a conversation on how do we experience uh, religious pluralism. So, I will not feed you with graph, with numbers, with maps. I will really try to discuss quite theoretically, but also f fitting in uh, some examples, the way I think we sociologists should more and more work on this idea of um, experience of religious diversity in secular context. So, I think I should start by uh, locating myself in the picture. 
And I like this picture because when you look at me today, it's quite different. And I think it touches upon quite deeply and, and, and very abruptly and also directly to one of the core issues behind this e issue of religious pluralism that we have this representation, like the one that you see on the slide, and you have reality, which is me tonight. And there well, are differences. The Photoshop is here. <laughs> so um, why do I need to locate myself? I need to locate myself because I'm not from Montreal, I'm from France. And what you see uh, on, the, on the graph here is the connection between specific dates, specific laws, specific regulations, norms that have emerged since 2004. And I left France in 2007 to move to Montreal. And since 2007 till last Monday, I've been caught by the same stories that happened earlier in Europe, but this time in Quebec. So if I would be a stand-up comedian, I'm sure I would, be, I would be making money out of it, but it's, it's really not funny. So I define this as my personal uh, academic and citizen drama. Uh, I can't escape the topic, which is good because it means that I will have work for the rest of my life. <laughs> in terms of theory and in terms of looking at this topic, and I'm saying that in front of people that have been working on these issues and have, have also brought very smart ideas on that, I think we've reached a point in which we need to breathe out. We need to bring some air and we need to get out of the ghetto of the people that speak to people who agree with them, meaning politically, but also epistemologically. My talk tonight will be addressing this issue of the experience of religious pluralism by focusing on France and Quebec. And here you have, I think, a clear image of the way we talk about the subject very differently. So on the left side, you have the, an extract uh, uh, an excerpt of the Décret d'application of the March 2004 law. This March 2004 law was the first law that was dealing in France with ostentatious religious signs. It's a law that says that it's forbidden for kids, for, for young boys and young girls in public schools to wear ostentatious signs. And I have underlined on the left side the wording that is used to describe these signs. So it reads. <coughs> the Islamic headscarf. It reads. The kippah or a big cross. And in the end of the text, it says that the law is, this is the application decree. It's not the law. It's the way you have to apply it once it's voted. The last sentence says, the law is so designed that it's able to even anticipate potential other signs we didn't think of it. And I see at least in this room one sign that is not in this text. Well, on the other side, you have images that are related to, I'm sure Annick um, spoke of it, so she probably used this image too. Uh, this is the iconography of the religious signs that were scheduled to be prohibited, uh, to be worn by public servants by the charter that was supposed to be passed as under the name of Bill 60 in Quebec. So here you have two models of the way France and Quebec have been dealing with the issue of visible religious difference. This is legal. On the one hand, it's a, a past law. On the other hand, it's a non-past law, but who knows, it may come back sooner or later. In both cases, what's important is that we see the regulation of specific signs, of specific symbols, that are clearly described, but not affiliated with any religion. It's not the religion that is banned, it's the sign of it. It's the indication that you are obviously affiliated with it. So there is no way that, as a practitioner, as a believer, you could, for instance, accuse the law of being explicitly discriminatory against you. But the interesting thing is that the religious sign that is absent on the left side, but in the right side, which is the, the Sikh turban, has been affected directly by the application of the law. And those are the three guys that were expelled from public schools because they were wearing these signs, have been going to court, to the different jurisdiction, in order to claim for their right to go to public schools 
wearing whatever they wanted to wear. But they were not anticipated by the law. So it gives you also instinctively the idea of how religious diversity is pictured in the French bureaucratic wording of how do you implement a law that is general in its aim but has to be specific in its implications. In order to be clear, I need also to tell you what kind of sociologist I am. Uh, sociologists are like we're a bunch of kingship, families, enemies, friends. We do different things. I'm a qualitative sociologist. And I'm interested in that type of question. I'm a fan of graphic novels. Uh, Will Esmer is my hero. And uh, this picture, I don't, I'm not sure you see that well at the, at the back. Uh, what's interesting me is the top one. The top part of the picture, it, it shows you two doorsteps. And uh, in front of one, there's a lot of garbages. On the other one, there is no garbages or a tiny little box. And the question that Will Esner is asking, it's an incredible series in which he works on New York and the way people live in the city and inhabit the city. He works on tiny miracles, the way people encounter each other and then disconnect, but then reconnect, etc. So it's a fascinating way of doing ethnography through design. And the question says, how come our rich people garages always smaller, occupy less space than poor people garages. This is the kind of questions I'm dealing with. I'm interested in looking at surrounding social facts by putting my attention obsessively on tiny details in order to link what I call and what other sociologists call troubles with issues. Troubles is something that you live with difficulty as an individual. Something that is an experience for you, a troubling experience, a, a problematic experience, but it affects you directly. And issues mm -hmm. refer to bigger questions, like global poverty, global warming, but then the temperature in Montreal affects me. So this kind of rebalancing in the analysis, this trouble with these issues, which is a vocabulary of a famous sociologist called Charles Wright Mills, is what I'm interested in in discussing religious diversity and how we experience it. So, in the first page of his book, Will Exner adds this thing, and I, I put it in for the philosophers in the room. So Will Exner is this uh, graphic novelist, does incredible design on very precise scenes in the urban settings. And on the first page, he had this huge quote by William James, who is the founder, I mean, the father of pragmatism, and the quote is interesting because the quote insists on the fact that James is basically saying, I'm not interested in big things. I'm not interested in the way things are rolling over us at the global level. I want to look at individually as a capillary, capillary thing that is happening and connecting us, all of us together, things are enriching each other and producing things that we didn't anticipate. And this is my approach. This is my approach, and let me give you an example if I switch back now to religious diversity. Paul is smiling because we had a huge discussion when I convinced him to put it in the book. <laughs> the book is on pluralism and radicalization, but I think this picture in particular uh, is, a well, is, is, is a good illustration of what I intend to convince you of doing even when you are getting out tonight. Uh, in connecting these big things with tiny little ones. Um, I'm here dealing with troubles and issues. And you have in front of you two pictures. Uh, on the left side, you have a poster that was used during the campaign in uh, 2009 in Switzerland, a campaign organized by a nationalist party, the Popular Party, to ask for the prohibition of the construction of minerals in Switzerland. And on the right side, you have a cartoonist, I'm very much into cartoon. Uh, you have a cartoonist that has uh, published this, uh, this drawing of him um, the day after the result of the vote. The result of the vote, it was a referendum uh, that took place in November 2009, and the result, final result is that 57.5% of the voters, and of course they were abstentionists, 
uh, voted in favor of prohibiting the construction of the, of the minarets. Um, what does the caricature show? The caricature show a Swiss couple. They are in front of a very, very nice um, house, typical Alpine house. That's the way I imagined Switzerland before I went to Switzerland. It's green, it's, it's, it's pretty much like Victoria, but higher. And, <laughs> and um, the mountainside is beautiful, and you don't see any minaret, you don't see any mosque, you don't see any direct threat of Islam. Still, the journalist is asking to this couple, and the woman is answering, she's saying, is Islam disturbing you? And the woman, who is really has power in the couple, is explaining that. She made this uh, kind of joke saying, uh, on devrait pas se voiler, il faut pas se voiler la face, uh, which is a, a, a play on, uh, of words. And the image is clearly a response to the other image. The other image is embodying, showing, illustrating the threat of Islam. It's, you have a territory that is symbolized by the map, the, the, the flag, the Swiss flag. It's covered by minarets. If you look really, really with attention, you see that the minarets look like missiles. And the first front, the, the front stage figure is a woman wearing, I mean, a figure, a female figure, that is really wrapped into a black, uh, a black, uh, a black piece of clothing. So the message is clear. <clears throat> if we want to stop the construction of minarets, it's because they're invading the country. I mean, there is no need to study and do a BA or MA or PhD in communication to be able to understand that. And it's, it's good because people were supposed to vote. People who were living here were supposed to vote, meaning people who had no direct experience of what this poster was talking about had to say, what, what their opinion, and their opinion was mostly in favor of it. So the idea with these troubles and issues is to say that you don't need to be troubled by something to have a clear position on it. This is basic, and you're saying, okay, it's now eight. Is she going on like that for a long time? <laughs> it's going to get very, very deep, very, very soon. First, I will show you how I work on that on a daily basis, keeping in mind the first slide, the slide that said that I've moved from France to Montreal with a certain experience of the discussion on religious science, and I discovered that in Quebec it's pretty much happening the same way. I live in a really, really diverse, pluralistic neighborhood from a religious perspective. I live in Outremont in Montreal. Outremont, in most of the city guide, is described as the Jewish neighborhood inside Montreal. In fact, we have a lot of neighbors. I say we because this is part of the job. We do diffusion of knowledge. So one of the things I'm working on now is working on how to talk to kids and to average public about religious pluralism what it means to do the experience of religious pluralism. I'm not an Orthodox Jew. But I live in a neighborhood where this kind of encounter, situation, back to pragmatism, situation, accomplishment of religious pluralism happen daily, every minute. The thing is, it's happening. The situation is really a situation of constant exposure to difference and to visible difference. But it does not mean that the experience is conclusive, that the experience is done. To do the experience in the meaning that I have as a sociologist working on this tiny little thing, I need interaction. Religious pluralism is not only the fact that a woman living in a mountain is able to have a clear-cut opinion on the construction of minarets and to put the story really into its uh, exhaustive presentation, Back to the minaret in the Swiss example. The result of the vote was 57.5% opposed to the construction of minarets. But at the level of the territory, there were only four mosques with minarets, and only two were planned to be constructed. 
And the female figure, you remember the black one, the female figure at the front stage? She basically doesn't exist in Switzerland. Because most of the Muslims living in Switzerland come from Kosovo, Turkey, and Morocco, where this kind of figure is quite rare. And if it exists in the country of origin, it surely is a very tiny minority in Switzerland. So here again, the notion of trouble and issues help you to manage what I call the missing link between what the charter was willing to achieve, what the law banning the religious signs in public school is achieving, and we're going to shift, switch to uh, other other legislation and other uh, decision, political decisions that were in the same um, kind of direction later. But what I want to insist in with showing you this uh, example is that I'm interested in how do you cope concretely with this kind of situation. This young red person is my daughter. We live in this neighborhood and every day since 2007 we cross difference. But we're embedded in daily routines. <laughs> And one of the daily routines that any migrant moving to Canada and largely to North America discovers <coughs> is Halloween. Right. We don't have Halloween in, in, in Europe. We're starting to have it, but no, nothing compared to what you have here. So obviously, we ended up having our um, way to celebrate Halloween. So it was three years ago. She decided to get uh, outside as a Kleenex box. <laughs> <laughs> Halloween, you're supposed to frighten people, and it was a year where she was the only one at school not being vaccinated against the influenza. So it was a year where everybody was convinced we would be dying because of this huge pandemia of um, flu. So she went out in Halloween saying, I'm a Kleenex box because it's really, it's really dirty, it's killing people. It worked out quite well. So here you have the real person, and here you have the reproduction. I'm working on this project with a Quebec-based um, guy who makes comics. Um, and I'm showing you what's happening. So we're just walking in the street. I'm an urban sociologist, so I'm interested in what's happening in public spaces. When you're really facing something that is disrupting your daily routine. So she's about... I, there's no, no words, so you don't need words. She's looking for candies, and finally, she meets an unexpected audience. Some of the Jewish kids of the neighborhood, visibly belonging to Les Hommes en Noir, the black men, as she named them at the beginning, um, were sitting on the top of the step just with candies. What was her reaction? She obviously decided that they were not the right person to ask for candies. So here she ran away. The design is soft. In reality, she really ran away, saying, no, oh, I don't have candies here. OK. And she has an obsessed sociologist mother. So I said, no, you know I do the nice part. And I sent her back. And here is what happens. She is going back. She is not convinced. What is here written, the guy, the big guy that is passing in front of it, He's really saying, he really said what he's saying on the picture. I don't know if you see that, if you can read it. He basically says, my daughter is asking me, why aren't they wearing things like I am wearing? And he says, ah, ha, ha, because they're disguised all the year, or the year long. Oh, so oh. he makes a clear racist statement, very hostile to this explicit, visible religious diversity. So I need to convince her. I need to tell no, try, give it a try. And it's really disturbing because it doesn't fit into the picture. The picture is nice white people who are wearing wigs and look like a terrific person open the door and give you plenty of horrible things, candies. And this is not happening. The guys are alone, it's kids. Normally kids are running in the street. They're not waiting at home to provide you with candies. So it's really completely going the wrong way for her. And she finally decides to go. And she comes back saying, I'm the only one going there. I don't have all of it. And nothing will be left for the others. So typical migratory reaction. And, and end of the story. This is just a 
an illustration of troubles and issues in another perspective. I'm here insisting on this observation dimension. I, I, I spend my time observing situation through which I can decompose and operate a kind of reconnection of these di different dynamics that goes through this issue of public religiousness, public religious visibility of religious minorities, what we do with that, how do we regulate it, and how do we communicate that. Now we come to serious business, meaning this was just the funny part. And now we get into the boring theoretical stuff, but at least you have images, you have pictures of what I have in mind. I started by saying that France and Quebec have similar ways to deal uh, with how to govern, how to regulate the visible presence of religious differences. And I'm a specialist of Muslim minorities, so I'm, I, I will now deal only with the specific case of Muslim otherness, Muslim religiosity, Muslim difference. And I think what this country, Quebec and France, share and have in common are these three, three dimensions. First, the framing, then the meaning, and then the gossiping. What I intend to convince you of with that is that our incapacity to connect, or our capacity to do it without knowing what we're talking about, to connect troubles with issues, place us in a trap, in what Mills calls an ordinary trap. That is, we're fed, we're fed with information, we know a lot, but we have no direct connection with the problem we're dealing with, which is fine. We don't need all to be poor to understand what being poor is. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that here we're facing political dynamic and juridical dynamic that aim at excluding from public services, from certain public spaces, specific gestures. As I said earlier, the, the law on the public school in France is not excluding religion from school. It says specific signs, and it lists it, are forbidden. It doesn't say Islam is forbidden at school. It says wearing conspicuous signs is forbidden. And among these signs, we have this and this and this and this. Same thing with the iconography. We clean, in a way, the public services. We clean it up. And we show you what you can't do. And I'm here insisting on the fact that wearing a sign means that you're wearing something that can be seen and recognized as such, but you're also accomplishing a gesture. When you're putting something on yourself, you're doing something. You're not just exhibiting it. And we'll come back later on this non-intelligibility of the religious gesture in this, in this two secular contexts. So let's start with framing. What does it mean, framing? Framing means that when my daughter is at Halloween gathering candies from the neighborhood, she's not acting in a void even as a kid. She's acting, so being surrounded by matrix, structures, institutional arrangements, organization, regulations, where the light is uh, produced in the street because it's Halloween and we have to uh, be safe when we gather these candies, when we collect the candies. So she is also interacting in the middle of this nodes, this set of, um, of framing, of institutional uh, matrix. And one of the matrices that Quebec and France have more and more in common is what me and a colleague have labeled a narrative of secularism. Both contexts, through the charter and through the different legislation banning religious science in France, have moved from secularism conceived as a political principle and a juridical normativity to a narrative. Secularism stands for national values. It performs a discourse on what we as a nation, we as a pays, we as a country should have to be and should stay. We wish to protect this value. National secularism has become a value to stand for, something to protect. And in France, it has been done through a clear positioning of the right wing on this topic, while in the case of the Charter, it has been promoted in clear interaction, which led to failure, 
with the sovereign discourse, with the discourse on the independence okay, of, of um, okay. So this is the first, um, a first point, first element of the framing that uh, Quebec and, uh, and France have in common. A second element of this framing that is affecting the way we, anonymous citizens, deal with religious science in public space is the fact that through this nationalization of secularism as a value, what is operated is also a displacement of the burden of neutrality. What this law are asking, what this legislation in France and the Project of Charter are asking, is basically that individuals perform neutrality. If you are asking to a pupil going to school, to public schools, to take off her headscarf, or for, for a guy to take off his turban when he's entering the school, you acting, you're asking them to perform neutrality, to behave as neutral citizens. But historically, neither in Quebec nor in France is neutrality a burden for the citizen. It's a burden for the state. And here comes the clash in the Charters Project. The famous, so controversial, Article 5 that stated that public agents, public servants, should not wear the sign that were indicated on the first image is problematic. Why? Because it's completely disconnecting and, and putting outside of the picture the rights of individuals to be who they are also as pious citizens, even when working. The situation gets more complicated because in the way the Charter was promoted, what was defended was that it would be a guarantee of neutrality of the state if the sign would disappear. And the minister during the commission, the parliamentary commission on the Charter said different, in different occasions, what if a nurse wearing a headscarf has to deal with a patient that is uh, suffering from a disease and he's also an homosexual? He, he made the question at least 10, 20 times during the audition. And one of the legitimate answers would have been taking out the scarf would not change the fact that the person may have an opinion that is completely negating the rights of gay people to get one of that and that. The problem being the collusion of these two <coughs> realms of rights, of jurisdiction, under the umbrella of defending neutrality, pretending that the value of secularism is attacked through the wearing of religious signs, which lead me which will lead me later to a, a short uh, reflection on the way we understand religion in secular context and why we're incapable of experiencing religious pluralism because we have a weird perception and definition of religion. So the displacement of the child and the burden of neutrality is something that is bringing, bridging the two contexts. Notwithstanding all the national differences, I'm not insisting on that, but I'm perfectly aware that the national history of France is not the national history of Quebec. The last framing that is really affecting the way we talk about religious science and the regulation of religious science in the public space in both contexts is Islamophobia. I'm not insisting on that, just saying Islamophobia has emerged in Quebec over the last three years, while in France it's something that is as much more history, long-term history, that can be uh, connected to the colonial episode. And it has been quite well investigated and also um, um, invested by NGOs and associations. While in, in Quebec, it's still very, very shy as a, as a notion. It's not so much used uh, in, the, in the public space. But still, it operates, I think, and that's what I want to share with you, as a matrix in which religious difference is being rationalized. That's what is written on the slide. Religious difference is made something that justifies a hierarchy. If you are visibly, explicitly showing, displaying your religious conviction by signs, by the gesture of covering yourself, whoever you are, from whichever um, religion uh, to whom, uh, whichever religion you belong, 
you are affiliated, you are being racialized in the sense that you are being negatively assessed as a citizen. There is something troubling, again to get back to the, with something that in a secular, with someone that in a secular context, knowing everything on the condition of in which pol pol politics is made, separation of religion and, and state, etc. There is something troubling with continuing to show the other, to show others that you are a pious person by wearing the gesture. So Islamophobia, I'm, I don't have time to develop it, but is another important part of this framing. So France and Quebec have that in common. This idea that secularism is national value. This idea that neutrality should be also in charge of the citizen, which is a contradiction with the definition of what neutrality of the state is, and the impact of Islamophobia. Now, we move to the second. Uh, we had framing, we're now moving to meanings. Because don't forget that I'm looking at situation. My little girl gathering candies, collecting candies. I'm looking at the framing of the situation, and I'm now looking at the meaning. Oh, why don't they dress up like us for Halloween? So how do you attribute meaning to what's surrounding you, to what's happening to you? Here what's interesting me, and you see I've got uh, three points. And actually it's difficult because I see the other, the other slide. Um, the first one is, uh, it's a generic question I'm trying to answer to by focusing on meanings, is to look at the place of the pious citizen in the secular context, in the secular urban context. And I have three arguments I want to make. The first one is very easy to me, and I think it will be familiar to you immediately, especially looking at the picture that is attached to it, is that in the secular context, France and Quebec, a pious good citizen, a good pious citizen, is a rational one. This is fascinating. The only way we, as secular context, make sense of religion is through the lens of choice. Example, in France, for the last 20 years, we've had this discussion going on of burning feminism, the feminist left, left, right wing ones, all the feminists have exploded thanks to the health of issues, opponent to the idea that they may choose to wear the headscarf. So for 20 years, we are talking about the fact that <coughs> why should we bother these women if they've chosen, if they've chosen to wear the headscarf? So if you look at the literature, if you look at the political statements, if you look also at the voice of the women wearing the veil that were listened to during the parliamentary commissions, for instance, in France, the only way we make sense of what they're saying as religious person is nobody is imposing me to wear a headscarf. I've chosen that. So I fit into rational perspective. I'm a rational actor even if I believe in something that is not tangible. So what I want to say with that is that the only way we make sense of a religious behavior is by wrapping it up under the umbrella of choice. This is, not, this is really important because it's a very, very <coughs> repetitive perspective. And let me give you an example that I really love. There is currently a, um, a case pending in front of the European Court of Human Rights, which is the SAS versus France. It's been pending since 2011. It's the first case of, the, of a French citizen, a French woman, who decides uh, she wants to claim for her rights in front of the European Court of Human Rights, and she's accusing France of violating a set of rights that she's entitled to freedom of conscience, uh, freedom of movement, etc., right? after the passing of the, of the October 2010 law, which is banning the concealment of the face in public space. But what this woman is saying to the judge is really interesting. And indeed, if it's pending since 2011, it's because it's been changing once already of chamber. Well, the first chamber gave the boiling thing to another chamber because it's a hard case. It's not that hard, but it's a funny case for them. I would have liked to be a judge sitting in the European Court of Human Rights for that. Basically, the woman is saying, it's not a choice. And nobody's imposing me to wear the niqab because she's wearing the niqab. And she wants to be a French citizen, free of movement, free of choice, free of freedom of conscience, 
but wearing the niqab. And she said, I don't decide really when I wear it, but I know when I'm allowed to wear it. She knows her place. She knows when she can or not wear it. So she doesn't wear it when she's at the airport. She doesn't wear it, and she, she does it in the testimony. She explains very carefully, when I go to the doctor, I don't wear it. When I pick up my kids, I don't wear it. I know that makes things complicated, so I don't do it. But sometimes, my spiritual mood dictates me to wear it. So if we rewind the thing and we go back to the idea that you're an audible citizen, a pious one, if you were able to tell me that you've chosen that to wear a headscarf, she is really not fitting into the picture. She's bringing in the idea that there is something external and that I cannot tell you what it is, she says. She says, it's not consistent. I don't do it all the time. It's a nightmare for a judge. Because you need facts and you need convergent facts. Another example, the famous Madame Majbour. Madame Majbour was a candidate, an applicant to the French nationality um, in 2008. She is the case which started again the controversy on the, full, uh, the ban of the concealment in public streets. Madame Majbour is a fascinating case because she went through all the different jurisdictions and she ended up at the Council of States asking the Council of State to cancel, to, she was appealing basically to a previous decision in which she was denied the right to become a French citizen. And here I need to read you what the judge said to justify the fact that she would not be a French citizen. And keep in mind that we're dealing with the way we talk about religion to justify the governance, the regulation of its public presence. So the decision was made on June, 2000, on June 2008. The Council of State denied the French citizenship to a Moroccan who wore the niqab. I'm quoting a, a piece I wrote, co-wrote with a colleague, David Poussin, deciding that the radical practice of her religion was incompatible with the essential values of the French community, in particular with the principle of equality between men and women. You have to know that to deny the right to become a citizen, the judge cannot decide it like that. You have to prove, to be, to be convincing, and you have to find convergent facts that show that the person is not properly assimilating. It's called défaut d'assimilation in French law. So the judge at the level of the Council of State has to do that. He has to do a kind of collection of elements belonging to the life of this woman that would converge one with another, and this is what matters here, the convergence of facts, to decide that yes, she can be a citizen, or no, she can't. So the question at stake here is access to citizenship. It's quite different from access to public services. We agree with that. It's basically access to a public good. Madame Majbou, in a distinct decision, speaks French, says the judge. She speaks French well, and her two children are educated in a state school. And while she was visited by a male gynecologist during her pregnancies, it remains that she carries out an almost reclusive life cut off from French society. She does not receive people in her home. In the morning, she occupies herself with house cleaning, as well as walks with her baby and children. And in the afternoon, she goes to the home of her father or father-in-law. For her groceries, she indicates that she can do her shopping alone, but admits that she most often goes to the supermarket accompanied by her husband. The judge then deduces that it seems that Madame Majbou has not met the values of the Republic, and in particular those of the gender equality. She lives in total submission to men and to her family, which is manifested as much in her manner of dress as in the organization of her daily life. She finds this normal, and even the idea of contesting this submission does not even occur to her. The judge finally rejected the plaintiff's application to French citizenship, and these conclusions were followed by the Conseil d'État, who thereby judged Madame Majbou had adopt, quote, adopted a radical practice of her religion, incompatible with the essential values of the French community, principally belief in the equality of the sexes. So what we have here, is a legal decision that is basically saying that this woman has a male gynecologist. She is raising her kids, she goes to the supermarket, 
She visits her family and she has no job. Plus, she speaks well French and her kids go to public state school. So we have a very basic average woman. I don't know how old she was at the time. But on, on, and, and remember, I remember you that the idea of the judge is to find convergent factor that should prove that she is really not assimilating. Here, the only factor that is proving to the judge that she is not assimilating is the fact that she is wearing a niqab. But what is interesting even more is that the judge is qualifying this practice. The judge is saying, this is radical. The way she dresses is radical. Again, if we make reading, neutrality of the state means that the state has no right to say anything about what a religion says about its own, its own practice. Mm -hmm. The state cannot. The line is clear, and you stay on the line if you want to be a secular. And if you want to be neutral, and we can discuss that later, neutrality of the state doesn't mean that the state has no value. It means that the state does not discriminate in any manners. And it has to learn how not to discriminate people that were not here when the laicity was implemented in France. So what's interesting in that, and what connects it with the charter, <laughs> is that you remember the first image I showed you, there were the, the prohibited signs. This one are the allowed signs. So if you're a Muslim, if you're a Sikh, if you're a Catholic, if you're whoever you are, here is the legit iconography. So the state is saying that if you're doing that, if you're entering the liberal, the liberal way of presenting yourself as a religious believer, that's fine. But if you look at what it means really, it means that the state is dictating what a legitimate religious behavior is, not a political behavior, a religious behavior. This is what, uh, again, Jeremy Stolo has, uh, has published on, uh, on this thing, and he says, paradoxically, the very state that proclaims it is trying to create and protect a religious neutral public space has ended up inventing religious practices that never existed before. Honestly, I don't know in the room, but I'm not sure if you, if you really uh, in relationship with uh, believers from these communities that are uh, on, on the slide, uh, I'm not sure that they are wearing these signs, and I'm not sure that they are attributing to these signs the same signification or significant meaning uh, as to the uh, pre previous one, the one that are um, prohibited. So the issue here with this uh, meaning is to focus, to insist on the fact that the perception we have of religion, of religious gesture, of religious decision, of religious behaviors, in the secular context, is very reductive, very biased. Now I'm moving to my last, my third element, after the framing, after the meaning, we come to the gossiping. This is something I've developed recently, so bear with me because it's uh, it's something new and it's pretty much the first time I'm presenting it in public, so I'm really curious about your comment and reaction. Um, what is gossiping? Because my purpose here is to say, it's very boring to work on this issue. It's really boring. <laughs> I mean, it's, you, you have to go through legislation, through terrible texts, tiny little articles that you forgot the page, the following page, and you have to read again. And it's, it's a very heavy literature. And it's a passionate political discussion. And between these two levels, you have people living ordinary life and trying to make sense of it. My interest as a sociologist is to try to go beyond and to say, wait, we've been for three decades in France obsessed with that. We had the headscarf in school, public school, outside. We had the burqa, so-called burqa, the niqab, the full veil uh, in public space. Out. Then I moved to Montreal, I had the Bush after law commission, the reasonable accommodation, uh, Islam or Islam, Muslim or Islamists, and the charter. So we had different countries, and I could add to this other European countries. I could add Germany, I could add Italy. All the, most of the European uh, members of the European Union have had to deal with similar issues under different forms. Rouge the Affair, the Danish cartoon, but we had a set of questions, stories, that really highlight the fact that this is a big problem for us, secular spaces. 
So what I'm interested in as a sociologist is to say, if we are that obsessed, if we cannot get rid of it, and the last one in France is that we will probably end up with a charter of felicity with the new government we have since last week. Because the guy who is ruling this government is, has defined himself in his uh, discourse to the nation last uh, Monday as a, a true Republican. And in general, behind true Republican is uh, secularism. So what I'm interested in is try to get outside of the box of religious studies. Try to get outside of the idea that, oh, it's just religion, it doesn't matter. I think it matters because I think it gives a lot of information on the way we define citizenship regime, on the way we project ourselves as secular space in national context under certain constraints. And I think gossiping is one of the way I make sense of this connection between religious science and public space and citizenship. Gossip is an informal conversation, usually taking place in the absence of the person that you're gossiping about. You're really gossiping in the face of the person you're gossiping about. What you do, that's, that's not gossip. <laughs> so it's an informal conversation which is taking place with the absence of the main uh, action. Um, it's also something that is relying on the absence of proof. In general, gossip, and here I'm relying on, a, a, you, I discovered a huge literature on gossip in political philosophy. Uh, I was really fascinated by that. The fact that gossip is a conversation between people who know each other and trust one another, and this trust creates authority. Uh, the fact that you speak, think about the, the newspaper we never read, but we all do. Like people, closer, all these scary things. Hmm? This is gossip. This is about the life of people. Uh, personally, I never, never met Cameron Dias. I never met Brad Pitt. I never met them. But I read that, and I feel, I believe what's said. Huh? And there are pictures showing it. So there is authority in gossiping. But you don't need to have connection, direct connection to the subject of the gossip. So gossip is interesting to me because it, it resembles very much what's happening with religious science of minority people in secular context. In almost all the parliamentary commissions that preceded the vote and the pass of the, of the laws I have been mentioning, and this includes also the Charter Commission, the Muslim women I'm interested in were rather absent. And when they were auditioned, they were auditioned at the end of the process. Because someone said, oh, we forgot the people we were talking about. We should have them in. And if you look at the, really, at the chronology of the audition, it's fascinating to see that they are the late comers. They are the main target, but they are the late comers. So the other, the other thing is that the no proof argument. You know, people make the first uh, page on, I don't know, a divorce or a rumor of uh, abortion or whatever. She had the lips <coughs> redone or whatever. But they don't provide us with proof. There is no, as Daniel Weinstock put it, talking about the charter, he says, it's a solution to a no problem. They, they, they established it. They saw it. They projected it. They drafted it. But there were no evidence that it was, e that it was needed. Even the wording of the minister that promoted the charter last September, where he was speaking of, a, we are here to speak for people who feel at unease with certain things. It's actually similar to what happened at the beginning of the discussion that led to the vote of the March 2004 law banning the religious science from public schools in France. No numbers. An increase, I'm quoting the Minister of Education, an increase of the problems related to headscarves. But no official reports, no numbers, no cases. Tiny case, individual one, local ones, but no in, in, a total incapacity to document the grounding of the juridical discourse and the decision to exclude these people. So this is also very common to gossip. You don't need any proof. Same thing with Islamicization. Islamicization was a word 
that dropped into the discussion about the Charter last October. It dropped into the discussion thanks to one radio listener who called a program on which uh, the Minister Brinville was interviewed and who asked a question saying basically, do you think uh, Islamicization of Quebec is, is a danger? And the minister replied by saying, Islamicization is a real concern. Once you take a, a word like this one and you put it in the, in the mouth of a minister, you, you, give, you give legitimacy. I'm, I'm not, again, it's not being against, being in favor. I'm not interested in that. I'm just interested in the circuits of Kosovo. How things circulate. And here I've got this uh, wonderful scheme. I'm very proud for my first PowerPoint. I'm quite proud. <laughs> so I've, I've illustrated all the participants to the gossip circuit in uh, the first one is about uh, Quebec. So I've written, uh, you don't see it so maybe at the back, but politicians, the Muslim legends. The Muslim legends, this is my wording, I don't know how it sounds in English, but uh, uh, in French we would call them, uh, pardon my French, halal Muslim, that is uh, the one that are accepted to speak up as Muslim by the people who are not Muslim. So in particular, Jamila Benavid and Fatima Udabepa. Journalists, the feminist voice, prominent and non-prominent. The editorialists, the bloggers, they are quite powerful and we, they, they're not that powerful in France, but in Quebec they are quite powerful. And here the last one is uh, what I call the Vox Populi. So the comments on blogs, the social networks, and also the, you know, the letters and the comments that you, you can read on the, on the bottom of an article on a pad, for instance, when people comment and give their opinion. So this is a kind of gossiping circuit in Quebec. And it's pretty similar to what's happening in France, the only thing that is changing is the type of actors that are uh, engaging, which is completely normal because the longevity of the discussion in France is the three times uh, or four times the one in, uh, in Quebec. So this gossiping thing is also very helpful to make people familiar with an issue. If I'm thinking of um, Elvis Presley, you know? Remember Elvis Presley? Yeah? He's supposed to be alive. You know that? He's alive. Who knows? This has been one of the main gossip on Elvis Presley for the last, since he, he's dead, actually. Sorry, for those who believe. <laughs> so the idea of gossiping is also that it makes you remember, remember the couple in the mountain, the Swiss mountain? They were familiar with the question. They had no clue, no experience, but they were familiar with it. They were, they were, they were part, they were recipients. Of the, of the gossiping thing. So it helps circulate assertions which, as they move away from the source and time of issue, begin to function as forms of validating and objectifying authority. And it facilitates very much the imposition of, of dominant idea. And it works in both cases. It works with the conviction that even if the headcuff is chosen, it's a bad thing. It works with Islamicization. It works with many issues that are connected with rationals to um, control the presence of religious signs in public setting. I cannot give more examples because I will um, go too far beyond the time. What I want to say at least, uh, and at last, is um, trying to wrap it up, <coughs> all these issues that I've been talking uh, about, in terms of this time transparency and visibility. Because again, keep in mind that my objective here is, I don't think it would have interest you to have a comment on Quebec elections with rate of participation and how many seats and and why did they lose? I mean, we can discuss that, but I cannot make an hour talk about that. I don't think it gives anything as, as material, as, as um, energy to what I want to map, to design here. And what I want to design is that this obsession, this scopophilia, as we call it, scopophilia is the love of looking, the fact that we, we, love, to, we love to look at each other. 
And the way we look at each other, in that particular case, the, the, the way we look at religious signs by, were by this woman has turned into a love-hate relation, of course, but it has turned also in, a, in an erasure of their voices. Um, what this transparency and visibility connection is trying to help you to, to grasp is the fact that what's happening in a way, and I'm just throwing it like that, what's happening, I had an article published in Le Monde last year called La Burqa, c'est Lady Gaga. So the idea is to, con to, to, to place the Burqa and the way we talk about and we look at it in, a, in the same movement as we contemplate people, VIPs, very famous people, you know, the one that you don't need, even I'm not able to recognize a song by Lady Gaga, but I'm able to recognize her, and indeed she's here. She's here wearing a burqa, a transparent pink burqa, because she made an old scenography around this issue some years ago during a concert. So why I'm doing that? I'm doing that because I think that the, the public discussion on the religious signs has created a capital of visibility to this woman. It, it, it achieved, in a way, the opposite of what this woman wants by wearing a headscarf. What they want by wearing a headscarf is be coherent with, with their belief, with convictions, and you can enter into interpretation with them of the meaning of the sign they were. Maybe it's out of modesty, maybe it's out of aesthetics, maybe it's out of love, maybe you have many reasons. But focusing and having a constant gaze on them has exposed them very, very radically in terms of what their intimacy is. And I'm always struck by the fact that it's completely forgotten in the public, it, it was completely forgotten in the public discussion in March 2004. The media were concentrated on, once we have passed this law excluding people wearing religious signs from public school, what will happen? First hypothesis, revolution. No, didn't happen. Second hypothesis, increase of the Muslim private schools. Didn't happen. Third hypothesis, they will obey. They will obey, indeed. No revolution, and out of 12 million of students going to public schools in France, 47 definitive expulsions. Meaning, 12 million students, 47 cases of definitive expulsion, disproportion. Mm -hmm. In French, we say, on accouche d'une souris, un éléphant qui accouche d'une souris. It means the result was close to almost non-visible. But among the ones who obeyed, there were a bunch of girls in different schools who made a strong decision. They decided to shave their hair. <laughs> yeah. That's really interesting. Empirically, because when you're 14 or 15, shaving your hair is, is, is quite a strong gesture. I mean, one of my daughter's friends did it because her mother had cancer, but this is embedded into a collective way of recognizing what it means to shave your head when you're 15. Here you have girls who decide to shave their heads to get rid of the obligation having to take off the headscarf. What is the meaning of that? It's a way to resist to a state's imposition, but also means that they don't want to endorse the mask of citizenship to be oriented that, that we want them to wear. Meaning, the gesture that we're really looking at, they really get rid of it. While the gaze is constantly obliging and forces them to, to go into these very radical intimate gestures. You share your first. So I'm in, in, in Turkey, I'm switch, shifting context and continent, but in Turkey we, we had this huge discussion um, in, in the end of the 90s around the Whigs. Women being denied to go to university wearing the headscarf started to wear wigs just to be left in peace because wigs, nobody cares. Nobody cares, but now now people care because now people make sense of these wigs instead of a headscarf. So 
these are moving, uh, moving things, and uh, and what it reveals is uh, the asymmetry. Second point, and I will switch to my, uh, come to my conclusion. The asymmetry. We keep looking at them, and we are all in this room able to identify. If I do a, a game here, and if I show you different different model of type of female garments related to Islam, I'm sure you have a hundred percent. You're all able to recognize a burqa, you're all able to recognize a niqab, a headscarf, and to place the right word under the right outfit. Even if you've never experienced it. Even if you've never seen it. You've never crossed it in the street. And I'm pretty sure, reminds me of the, the headline on the Reykjavik grapevine. Have you read the Reykjavik grapevine? <laughs> I did it once. It was in February 2011. They had this incredible discussion on with the book on the front page, we should think of having adopting a law before it comes here. Basically, they were anticipating the fact that the sign would one day or sooner or later come. And I'm not making fun of them. I'm just saying this belongs to gossiping. Because the justification by the MPs who proposed this law was to say, before it's too late, and because we are part of the Western societies, we have to do something. As I present it, it looks ridiculous, and I'm happy uh, you're following me after so many talks. <coughs> so the gaze that we, that we don't wear the veil, Muslims and non-Muslims alike, have constantly on these garments, expose them to our scrutiny, constantly. Like, uh, like Lady Gaga, when she was wearing meat and appearing on, uh, on the street half naked, we just look at them and they confirm or they behave to, uh, I mean, in relation with our expectations. What I'm insisting on here, what I want to come to, is the idea that this is not a direct relation. Remember, I'm interested in situation, how you cope with difference when you're in country. This is all experienced, in most of the case, by proxy. And here numbers are useful. The threat of Islamization of Quebec is, in terms of numbers, nonsense. The Muslim population is 1.5% of the Quebec population. I know we're not a lot of persons living there, but still, 1.5% is not a number that calls for Islamization. Plus, these people <coughs> came through legal policies. They were welcome in the framework of immigrant migration policies. And once they were here, they stayed, and they are perfectly in uh, rule with what uh, the Quebec government is expecting from them as, as, a, as permanent resident or temporary resident or for citizen. So this idea of connecting transparency and visibility it's just a way to think or to try to elaborate on the fact that we are asking pious citizens to be transferred. In order to make sense of who they are as pious citizens, we ask them to be completely explicit. They don't have anything to hide. Such secret is not even possible. When we deal with intimacy, intimacy is something gossip is about revealing the secret of the others. It's about going deep into the intimacy of individuals. It's really digging into dirty things to try to come out with something original that nobody knows about this person. This is exactly the same process that is going around uh, the discussion. And that explains, I think, to me, the longevity of the discussion. And I will conclude by showing you a last picture. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, this is one of my favorite movies. I was scared to how. And I discovered that they, they, it was uh, set up in Tadoussac, in Quebec. So I was, I was even more happy when I discovered that. Um, so do you remember this, The Shining? Uh, the idea between The Shining is um, what works is that the rapid escalation of events, things, one after the other. The shifting of a good guy, average father, Jack Nicholson, into a monster that is really to become a, a beast who would be able to kill his own kids. 
the psychological transformation of this character. And I think this is pretty much what's happening, what happened with the charter. <laughs> and I published it, so I'm quite explicit on that. If you look at the last six months, in terms of drama, in terms of staging of the characters, who's the bad guys, who is turning into the bad guys, who is made even worse guy, we have similar similar process. Something completely normal and not nothing from the outside makes you think that there may be a problem is turned into a big problem. And divides the country very, very, very rapidly with no return point. And that's my last word. Monday, after I got elected, Bernard Manville had this sentence that I've written on the top, saying, la charte, c'est fini. I think Quebec is really just starting to experience what the charter has lift up or opened up. Uh, I don't know what is uh, the right word. So, on this note of optimism, <laughs> I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Fantastic. So we have some time, maybe 20 minutes or so, for some conversation, questions, comments. I have a mic. I'll come around and give it to you. Good luck. You talked about secularization almost as if it's the ideal or holy grail or whatever. In my understanding, secularization or secular means no religion, kind of like atheist means no religion. Would you agree? And is that really the ideal that was being sought for or somehow promoted subconsciously at least? By the way, an excellent lecture tonight. I enjoyed it very much. I don't think I've, um, thank you for the question, it's a very good one. I don't think I've uh, said secularization. I've stick to secularism. So secularism is a political principle that is organizing the political space, the public life, and that has two objectives. The objective is equality between religion, between people, and freedom of conscience. I'm, I, I should have the right to believe or not to believe, and I should, the freedom of conscience is quite extensive. It's not only you in your living room, it's you outside. You, you also have the right to practice and to visibly show that you're um, a, a religious convicted person by joining a church or whatever religious group you're a member of. And to achieve these two objectives, secularism relies on two tricks. The first one is the neutrality of the state. And the second one is the separation between state and churches. This is the ideal typical model. Then it's got different variation according to the country. You know, France is a radical separated state, it's a radical laicity. You've got contexts like the German one in which you have a more collaborative model. Uh, so this is the thing. It's, it's nothing to do with secularization. But I would never say that secularism means no religion. I would say that in the implementation of the jurisdiction and of the law, the state has as a mission to enable equality and freedom, whatever freedom and whatever content is at stake. You may last thing that you may be, this is Olivier Roy had this example in um, Islam in la Republic. He started the, the book by saying, you may be oppressed, and like the nurse that Dranville mentioned uh, constantly, you may be a priest and be opposed to abortion. You may and you may say that, and you may have a blog, and you, you can even convince your fellow, your fellow believer that this is the right thing and that etc. What you're not entitled to do and what the state has a mission to impeach you to do is to impeach me or her to get abortion uh, as, a, as in my freedom of conscience. So this, this is a very tiny line. The problem is that on big issues, it's very easy to draw it. On more hard cases, and I don't think religious minority signs are the hard cases. I think the really hard cases are, um, and Cécile Laborde is working on that, freedom of conscience and objection of conscience. Uh, one of the articles of the Charter 
that was never discussed, but that for me is one of the most problematic ones, is the Article 12 that says basically that all what is said at the beginning is fine for no public uh, servant with religious signs, with some exceptions. Doctors, and I forgot the second one, but yeah. there are two, two professions, two public servant type of people that are accepted. They have the right to object. This is really the hard case. What is justified, what is not, in terms of this objection? That's been quite a while, but I've been to an academic talk by Lady Gaga Nichols and that was pressing for the But more seriously, uh, I think you gave us a very sophisticated account of how uh, these the sentiments that you describe are popularized in, in, in urban culture, but I still can't help the question, you know, where does it come from? Right? You, know, you, you see it, you know, at a couple of things. You know, one is the widespread uh, xenophobic sentiments, you know, you have a couple, a Swiss couple there, but then clearly the political elite figures prominently in popularizing these kind of notions. It seems strange to see Quebec and part of Canada going down the same road as, as European societies that struggle with very different legacies of immigration, um, histories of colonization. You know, it's, it's just so different, but still you see very similar pattern. You know, where do you see, see this coming from um, over the last couple of years? The only, the only thing I've not mentioned, and it was part of the, of the talk that would have been too long. Um, I think uh, a proper analysis of the racial structure of the state, of the, of the racial structuring of the state trajectory nationally, has to be met. It has to be done in connection with that. I'm, I'm more and more convinced that in this discussion, religion stands for race, and that it's oh a prolongation, or I don't know how to phrase it properly, I apologize. Um, yeah, it's the, when I say racialization, it's really because I'm... I think religion stands for race in all the discussion. It's the process of othering that is quite radical, if you really look at the, at the consequence of that, because I've not mentioned it, but uh, it's not only... Um, and I apologize to the Muslim person, it's not when I say it's not only... It's not only about headcar, it's also about uh, defamation of, uh, um, uh, destruction of uh, cemeteries, it's about um, denial of, uh, the, for instance, the March 2004 law was strictly restricted to public schools. It says, the law says, the application decree says, written, I read it again today to be sure, it doesn't concern, it doesn't affect the parents. Since 2004, I mean, the, the, the most impressive movements I've seen emerging in France among the Muslim communities is the parents' movement. Because women wearing the veil are not entitled and allowed to go to school to pick up their kids. In, in France, until 10 years old, you have to enter the school to pick them up. So they're, they're denied the access to the school, to the place where the kids are. Not out of security, because you can recognize them, but because they wear a headscarf. So I'm more and more into this literature where, where it has, I think we have to face it. It, it has to be connected with race. And, and also because one of the constant uh, statements that I've made comparing different European contexts is that anti-racist movements have been so reluctant in engaging with this cause. The headscarf issue, the religious science, it's, it's, a, it's a dead end for them. So they never, never incorporate these issues inside their, their mobilization. And the last thing is that we are facing now in Europe movements in which not only certain gestures are forbidden, but people are being physically assaulted. And uh, we have at least um, around 10 people who died, including Marwana Shervini in Stuttgart, uh, who was killed in the middle of her own trial by uh, the guy she was suing. So we have a, a picture that is not only... Not only <coughs> Uh, with headscarf. We have something that is more, I think, um, intense and, and dramatic. Uh, but again, it's, we're not a lot of scholars working in that perspective because it's very positive. 
So thank you very much, Valerie. That was a wonderful talk. And I, I, so I have a kind of a comment question, um, and and it's uh, it, it it takes from your, the, one of the very first things you said, which is you want to look at secularism as a narrative, um, and that in that narrative, what has happened in part is that religious difference has come to justify hierarchy. So. These are two things just from your talk, and I think those are really uh, intelligent things. I think those are, uh, those are great, uh, wonderful observations. But my question is, so if, if, if secularism is a narrative, which means that we have to think about what's going on in any particular place when we talk about how secular, what secularism means or what, how religion works within a particular context, and if in this context, or if in Quebec, or if in uh, parts of Europe, uh, religion has come, religious difference has come to justify hierarchy, then what are the prospects for something like reasonable accommodation, which seems to illuminate religious difference, actually draw attention to religious difference, and incorporate it into the public sphere? It actually, I mean, there seems to be a dilemma, actually, here, which is, on the one hand, that there is an equality narrative about how to te treat people equally um, that is clashing mm -hmm. with a second-class citizen narrative. Exactly. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And I, I, I mean, the charter precisely tried <laughs> to disconnect secularism from the obligation of equality. They were even thinking to add specific uh, restriction to the Charter of Rights. And uh, they were even at the end, Pauline Marmot was even thinking of asking for the exemption, like we have the right to do our own business. So I think you're right in saying that the problem they have with reasonable accommodation is that it doesn't connect immediately with secularism. It has nothing to do with it. It's about equality, equality of rights, and compensation for people who are discriminated indirectly or directly. While in the secularism context, secularism is here to provide equality among religion and among representatives of the, of, of the different beliefs, uh, but it has also the, the burden of achieving, achieving freedom. And that's where it disconnects from uh, the, the main narrative of, uh, of equality in the, in the sense of reasonable, reasonable accommodation. Reasonable accommodation is not a wording that exists in the European context as such. It exists, but at the European level, at the European um, juridical level, not at the national level. But indeed, concretely, the secular uh, experience of France is full of reasonable accommodation, not classified as reasonable, but accommodation of pragmatically differences and adjustment, tiny little adjustment. Uh, you've been listening to Annick Germain, she used the word social transaction. So typical uh, social transaction is uh, the typical wording that we use for reasonable accommodation. It's not a juridical wording, but it's a way to say secularism is an ideal, it's an origin, it's a framework. It doesn't exist completely. It has to be jurisprudentially produced and it has to be activated politically. But the thing with the, with the charter, because I think you were referring to the charter, is that it tried to disconnect, to isolate. When we say narrative, we have in mind that the, the, what we define as narrative is the fact that you code, you, you operate a coding in terms of national value of something that is jurisprudence. The history of secularism in Quebec and in France, it's the history of jurisprudence. That's why I said earlier, that'd be pretty boring. It's not something that is coded in terms of national value. And that's where you see the ship operating. And once the ship is operated, here comes the classification. And again, again it's, it's very tentative. It's, I'm, I'm discussing with you more than stating things. We should. Yes, thank you for the talk. Um, so, let's just say if you need. But uh, in Quebec, there's, there's the interesting education program, the Ethics and Religious Culture Program. I wonder if you could continue about, uh, on this note of the narrative and expand on maybe how you see that program in Quebec schools fitting into the narrative of secularism in Quebec perhaps in comparison to, or in contradistinction to what's happening in France? Uh, um, yeah, it's a very good question. Um, the only experience I have 
uh, of sociological work on that is uh, a field work we did last um, year with uh, colleagues of mine in the field of education. We studied um, Jewish private schools, four Jewish private schools in, in Montreal, and we compared them, we sat basically in, uh, in the classroom, uh, fifth and sixth grade, and we were observing how the curriculum, the main, the main curriculum, the one, uh, they were all um, school with agreements uh, with the state, so how the main curriculum was uh, articulated with the religious teaching and the Hebrew teaching and the Yiddish, etc. Uh, so this is the only, I'm, I'm speaking on the basis of that. And I'm also speaking on the basis of some expertise I've done for um, legal jurisdiction um, in the framework of what is called the deconfessionalization du système scolaire, meaning the unchurching of the national education. Because the core of the TK culture religieuse has to be located in that process. The fact that you take out, you take the school out of the hands of the churches, but you don't take religion out, religions out of uh, the civic education of the citizen. Uh, from my observation, I mean, it's, it's very different. Uh, I think the main problem with this teaching is not so much the problem that it doesn't fit with secularism. I think it fits perfectly with secularism. Uh, I find it quite brilliant that kids learn about other traditions and for a mother of a, a young girl who's been schooled also in, in the United Kingdom, I've noticed that there are a lot of similarities in terms of education to religious diversity in a very concrete way. Uh, if you compare to France, uh, where the cultural and religious illiteracy is one of the highest, uh, every time there are um, national comparison, national survey, the, the, the religious illiteracy is something, the holy ignorance, uh, as uh, Olivia was said, uh, is, uh, is striking. So I don't think it's contradictory with secularism or it doesn't fit into the picture. What I think is problematic is the training of the teachers. Because teaching culture, uh, ethique et culture religieuse um, stop after the hour of teaching. But then you have to cope with discussions that engage religious identities of the pupils in other circumstances and teachers. It's, it's, it's a basic issue I'm saying, but they're lacking training because nobody wants to address this difficult question in the training of, this, of the students to be teacher. It's labeled under intercultural problematic, but not in terms of religions. And it, it brings us back to this idea that our intelligibility <coughs> of religion, it, 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 as if religion would be something really characterized by in, its incongruity in, in secular context. And when it comes to knowledge, uh, I think it's really, really problematic. Valerie, one of the uh, most interesting observations you make in, in, in your writing is the peculiar leap that people make from uh, their own personal troubles to having broad mm -hmm. opinions about broader uh, issues. And I, the, the insights you have here about gossip, about how that, in a sense, fuels that leap from issues, from, from troubles to issues, is interesting. And then it, it makes me wonder, how does one correct that? Right? Because in a, in, if I say, well, did you hear that Brad Pitt got a, a full body blood transfusion so he could look more handsome? You could say, well, no, actually there's no evidence of that. And, uh, you know, his doctor just went on, on screen yesterday and said that, that didn't happen. So one can correct a false piece of gossip. And yet, in the case of many uh, strong opinions people have about religion, in the case of when people leap from, from troubles to issues in the case of religion, it's very difficult to correct that. Often when you say, actually, it's not the case that Muslims or Sikhs or Jews do X, Y, or Z. Actually, you're wrong about that. The, the anxiety remains. So it seems as though it's not a cognitive problem, it's not, it's not a factual problem, correct? There's something else at work there. And I wonder if, just very briefly, you can give a couple sentences about it. I'm asking you to go from being a sociologist to being a psychologist, I guess. Um, yeah, I think it's pretty much a problem. Yeah. I mean, part of the problem. But it's, it's also a question of scales. Uh, the thing is, uh, if, if, you live, if you address these issues by proxy, and if you experience it directly, we all know that's a big difference. Uh, and this is a good example. I live in the middle of one of the most segregated and racist, explicitly anti-Semite neighborhood of Montreal, while we're in the middle of it. And the difference between people who are explicitly anti-Semite, like, for instance, if you are uh, selling your condo, uh, do you have a clause saying we don't sell to Orthodox, or you don't? 
You can't because it will not be legal. But uh, you say it to the agency, do you mention it that you don't want to visit? Or you want to visit the police, you don't want them. Uh, about the dirt, we're back to race. We're back to the discussion in the 80s in France about the les bruits et les odeurs. They are nasty and they smell. Same thing here. So the, the, the racialization is never, never far, and never very far. But my main concern with that is it's very easy to propagate, to, to fuel gossip. It's so difficult to counter, counteract it. And the only answer is grassroots activism. Grassroots activism on a very, very local basis. That's why I'm in favor of this kind of initiative rather than, you know, I always, always say, I moved to Montreal. I was so happy. I left Europe. I had a job in Europe. I was at the CNRS Curap, as you said. Uh, I had a job for life, and I didn't need to teach. I was a research fellow, so heaven. And I accepted this position in Montreal. I have never been in Montreal before my job talk. Never. Why did I accept that? And I was in Florence, which is a nice city. Oh, oh, everybody is saying, why did you leave Florence to go to Montreal? Because in Montreal, I could phrase and use the word I wanted to describe the things I'm working on. Talking about race, talking about minority. But now it's becoming very similar to the context I've been living, so I don't know where I'm going to be moving next time. But I don't have an answer, and it's part of the frustration, because I arrived saying, this is interculturalism. There is multiculturalism, but I don't see any difference, honestly. So my, that's my main concern. That's why I'm back to situation. Thank you very much, and please join me in thanking Bella and The grander scheme I have is that she will realize that she'll have to, having left Florence for Montreal, she's going to have to leave Montreal for Victoria, where none of these problems exist. <laughs> because this is Fantasy Island, right? But, uh, yes. At dinner, we did convince her of that. But we do look forward to her coming back perhaps as a, as a fellow at the center, and so you'll have another chance, hopefully, in the future to hear her uh, talk a little bit more. But thank you very much for coming out, everybody. I would like to mention that this is the last talk of the City Talks uh, lecture series. Uh, they'll start up again in the fall, and I think that the theme of the first chunk of them is going to be environmental justice. So uh, keep an eye on the websites, uh, and uh, you'll see who's coming, and when they're going to be speaking, and they will likely be speaking here. So have a good evening, everybody, and thanks again to Valerie and the